When I got into addiction treatment 15 years ago, one of the things I quickly realized was that there are a lot of addicts in our culture. In fact, the statistics right now say that over 10% of a population group will be people who are struggling with addiction. So if you look at Winnipeg, that means that in Winnipeg, there's probably about 100,000 people struggling with addiction. That's a lot of people. And that number is increasing. And what I have found is that there's not many families anymore in our culture or in churches who have not been touched by addiction. It is so prevalent out there. And I think for many, we're not equipped to help people adequately. Second thing that I realized as I got into addiction treatment world at 15 years ago is that I had really come into that world at a very opportune time. Because right at that point in time, there's a whole lot of research that was starting to happen, both in the brain and the underlying issues of addiction. Dr. Gaber Maté, who was a medical doctor on East Hastings Street in Vancouver, he said, and he wrote a book about it, and he said all the addicts he dealt with come from complex trauma or childhood trauma. And they grew up not feeling safe, is what it basically means. And so research began to happen, and what came out of all of that is, yes, 97% of addicts come from childhood trauma, some form of trauma, and I'm going to talk about that next week. And so that led to this understanding that there's a common issue that we need to address if we are, not, if we are going to help addicts. And that's what most treatment centers have not done. They're all beginning to realize the importance of it. And so REACT was started in order to begin dealing with that issue with people who struggle in addiction. Then the third thing I realized when I entered into this wor world of addiction treatment was that our government and churches haven't done a very good job in dealing with it. Government has poured billions of dollars into it and most treatment centers only can say they have a success rate of 5 to 10%. And that's not a very good success rate for dealing with a problem. Sadly, in many churches, they've done a bad job as well. And I think part of the reason for that is that there's been a definition that has been given to addiction that is not accurate. And the definition basically has been, in the past, Addicts have poor willpower. If they only would pull up their socks and get more discipline, they could lick this problem. And so what happened with that kind of definition is everybody then judged addicts, looked down on addicts as being people of poor willpower. And I hope to show you this morning that that is no longer an accepted definition because science has shown us otherwise. Sometimes within the church, many Christians said, Addiction is a part of people rebelling against God. And therefore, it is a spiritual problem, and it is sin. Therefore, what is needed is just people get right with God, and then they'll be fixed. And that has done tons of damage. And I have counseled hundreds and hundreds of people who have been damaged by that message. So what I want to do is something that is a little different from a normal church service. I want to give you some science today and give you an understanding of addiction from a scientific perspective. And then next week and the week after, I want to show you from the Bible what it shows us about dealing with the underlying issues. So I want to begin by showing you the brain. We have been so helped by the research that has happened in brain imaging. So there's a picture of a healthy brain, very smooth on the outside. And the next picture is that of somebody who's using cocaine. What you immediately see is, wow, that's a little different than a healthy brain. Those aren't literal holes in the brain. That is just parts of the brain that aren't working because of the use of cocaine. And so to a machine, they look like they're holes. The next one is crystal meth and how it affects the brain. That was... That picture was taken about 10 years ago. What we have seen in the last five years, especially in Winnipeg, 
Crystal meth has become the main problem drug. And it is not much more toxic than it was 10 years ago. And the damage that we're seeing often is permanent and it is long-lasting. But you can see that crystal meth does a lot of damage. The next one is of great interest right now, and that's cannabis or marijuana, pot, weed, whatever you call it. And there you can see evidence that it's not the safe drug that people are saying it is. It does a lot of damage to the brain. Next one is the party drug, the ecstasy. Those pictures were shown to a neurologist, and he said that's the kind of damage that happens in the brain with somebody that's had a stroke. And then the final one is alcohol, and these are pictures of somebody who's just a weekend warrior, or they just get blasted on the weekend, and they've been doing that for a year, and that's what's happening. Now, before you could look in the brain, we really didn't know what effect that drugs were having on the brain. But what you can begin to realize is, wow, there's a lot of damage happening up there. Now, not, that's only one part of the brain stuff and the research, what the research is showing. The next part is all around brain chemicals that are affected by drugs. So drugs and alcohol affect a variety of different chemicals in your brain, but there's one chemical they all affect, and that's the chemical dopamine. And if you're familiar with that, that's the chemical that is released and gives you a feeling of pleasure. So if you eat something you really enjoy, the brain releases dopamine. You go, wow, that was good. I'd like to have that again. So all drugs and alcohol release dopamine in the brain, and that's what causes the pleasure or the high or the rush. I want to give you a graph to just help you appreciate what happens in the brain with the use of drugs and their dopamine limit. So let's say your baseline dopamine right now sitting there is zero. That's your normal then if you were to go home and have your favorite meal, steak, lobster, whatever, your brain would release dopamine. We can actually measure that in the brain. And so we'd measure it and say, okay, we'll call that one. Baseline zero, one when you eat your favorite food. Then if you were to go and do your favorite activity, which for most people has a sexual component, what you would find is it would only go to two. Twice as much dopamine is released as when you eat steak. And so therefore, our graph from sitting there doing nothing to your most favorite natural activity in the world goes from zero to two, okay? Now a person smokes crack or meth. They release the most dopamine, and that's why they're the most addictive of all the drugs, and they give the greatest high, the greatest rush. But the amount of dopamine that goes into the brain when a person smokes crack is 10 to 12. Now, you got a problem there. The brain does. It's like you have a car that is made to run between 0 and 2,000 RPM. We're made to have a brain that goes between 0 and 2 dopamine. But you get, give your kid the car to use, and he wants to run, run the engine at 10 to 12,000 RPM. Something's going to burn up, explode, die. So when you put in all that dopamine into the brain that is way more than it was designed to have, the brain starts to panic. And it says, we've got a problem here. If this continues, we're going to burn up. So the brain goes into survival mode to try and protect you and the brain from damage. So the first thing that it does is it starts shutting down dopamine factories. It says, SOS, shut down dopamine. We got way too much dopamine happening here. So what happens the next time an addict smokes crack? They don't get quite the same high because there's not as much dopamine. Now, that's not a problem for an addict. They just smoke more. That's all that. So what the brain discovers is the solution of shutting down factories doesn't solve the problem because they just smoke more synthetic dopamine. So the brain has to go to plan two, which is a very severe plan. And when you understand this, then you understand what addiction is. The brain says, I will therefore change chemically. So think of it this way. 
When you're sitting there with your baseline normal dopamine level of zero, and that's how you feel, but you put putting 10 to 12 in there, loving the high, the brain says they love this 10 to 12 thing. So I'm going to change my soup recipe so that 10 to 12 now will feel like the zero used to feel. So that now when they smoke crack, they won't get high at all. They'll just feel normal. And that's what begins to happen. So the brain switches, changes its soup recipe of all the chemicals, creates a new one so that what used to be 10 to 12 now feels normal. Now that's a problem. Because what the brain now is saying is, I am dependent on you putting in lots of dopamine. I need you now to give me that quantity of dopamine if I'm going to feel normal. So let's just put it this way. Let's imagine a person's been smoking crack. They don't get high anymore. It's causing problems. So they say, I quit. So now you're not putting any synthetic dopamine in and all the dopamine factories are shut down. And your brain is going into panic mode in a new way saying, whoa, I need dopamine. And i got to get it somehow. So just think of it this way. Our brain monitors the amount of water in our body. It knows what we need as far as water to be healthy. And if our water dips below what it should be, we get the sensation of thirst. Now, if you went a day without water, two days without water, your brain would go into panic mode saying, I need water or I'm going to die. And it would become obsessed with getting water. And it would go, I'm, a, I'm prepared to lie, cheat, steal, but I have to have water. That's what happens when a person quits once the brain has changed chemically. The brain is saying, hey, i got to have that much dopamine. I'm going to die if I don't get it because I need that to be normal. So you get this obsession that is willing to lie, cheat, steal in order to get more of the drug. So that's what's beginning to go on in the brain. Now let me take that a little bit further that the person's quit. So you quit, and then, like I said, no synthetic dopamine. All the dopamine factories are shut down. Now it takes three to six months for the dopamine factories to get up and running again. What that means is for the first three months of recovery, you don't have any dopamine in the brain. So you play with your kids, you don't get any pleasure. We call it anhedonia. You do what you used to do to enjoy and have a lot of pleasure. It doesn't do a thing for you. Everything feels blah. Now, an addict doesn't usually know that if they just hang in there past three months, they'll start to feel pleasure normally again. What they realize is, I haven't had any pleasure for three months. And it feels like I'm going to go the rest of my life without any pleasure. I can't live like that. That is a terrible way to live. I've tried what used to give me pleasure. Nothing does. And so about three months, about 90% of addicts relapse because they say, i got to have some pleasure and the drug's the only thing I know that will give it. That's how powerful that brain change thing is. Now let me take it one step further. If a person quits, they get through those first three months, They start to feel pleasure normally again. And it takes the brain one to two years to get everything reset back to the old soup recipe for feeling normal, for healing the damage. About 95 to 98% of the damage caused by the drugs can be repaired, which is really amazing. And they go on for a few years, let's say three years, five years of clean time. And then one day they decide to pick up the drug. And they smoke crack after five years, and a huge 10 to 12 dopamine rushes into the brain. Do you want to know what goes on in the brain? The brain goes, oh yeah, I still got that recipe that I created for that much dopamine. And in one day, it switches its chemistry back to that old recipe. And so what the addict finds is that they don't really get much of a high. And within a day, it's like they never quit. They just pick up where they left off. They can't go back to what it was like when they first started using drugs in the beginning. So the brain changes chemically, 
And then it becomes dependent on that chemical. That's addiction. And that's what makes it such a challenging thing. It's a biological event in the brain. Now, one of the things that we have developed in order to say, okay, what then are the criteria that we would use to measure whether a person is truly an addict? So we come up with seven different criteria that measure whether a person's an addict. So number one is loss of control. So that person who has been clean three years, five years, they might be in their brain going, I could just have one. I think I can control it. I'm going to just take one hoot off my crack pipe or have one beer and I'll stop. As soon as that gets the chemicals into your brain, the brain goes, yippee, we're back to where we our old recipe, and you can't stop because the brain says, give me more, I need it now. And so the loss of the ability to control the drinking, the using, is one characteristic. With that is an obsession. So once the brain is taken over with the, the, old, the new recipe, and it now needs it, it is obsessed with getting it. So finding the drug becomes the center of your universe. Recovering from it, lying about it, getting past consequences, all of those things, now drugs are all you think about. And that is the obsession. And then the third is once the brain changes chemically, the person's using, but they've got bad stuff happening. They lose their job, they lose their home, they lose their marriage, their health is affected, but they can't stop. They keep on going, even though there's many adverse consequences. That's not poor willpower now. That's a brain that's changed and is demanding that you get it. And then tolerance simply means you need more and more and more to try to get the same effect. And then withdrawal distress is when a person quits. I don't know if you've ever been with an addict when they've started to withdraw, they cannot sit still, they pace, they're antsy, they're sweating, they're, they're just in a very panicky state, because the brain is saying, get me some, get me some, I need it, I need it, I need it, and it is a war that goes on inside of them. The next two are the very painful parts of it. When a person uses, and they've lost or damaged or hurt their family, their loved ones, They've hurt themselves. Afterwards, they don't get the high. They just feel guilt. They feel so much shame. What have I done? Why do I keep doing it? And they promise, I'm going to stop. I'm going to stop. And then once withdrawal kicks in, they forget their promises because their brain says, give me more. And so they use again. And then they start a cycle of using guilt, remorse, withdrawal, using. And it just becomes a vicious circle that they can't stop. And part of what happens within that cycle is this. As they continue in the cycle, they start doing things they said they never would do. They start lying. They start cheating. They start stealing. They start violating their morals and values. They might even sell their body on the street just to get more. Stuff that they said they never would do. And so when a person is so dependent on the brain that they are prepared to go against everything they've stood for, that's addiction. Now I want you to understand another piece around this. So far I've talked about chemical addiction, drugs, alcohol. There's another type of addiction which we call process addiction. And what that means is an activity. So take God has given us food to enjoy. When we begin to use food outside of God's design for food, in other words, we use it in a healthy way to cope, to medicate our emotions, it then can develop into a bad habit and then it can gradually develop into an addiction. God gave us sex to enjoy. But if we start using it outside of God's design, it begins to build patterns in the brain and release dopamine that our brain can change chemically. So you can have a person who's struggling with pornography, but you can also have a person who's addicted to pornography. The one is they're just struggling, but they're working at it. 
The other is they've been doing it so long, the brains change that they just can't stop. How do you know the difference? We use those seven characteristics. When a person continues to gamble, eat, use sex or pornography in a way that they're doing it, even when bad stuff is happening, they're losing stuff, they're going against their own morals and values on a consistent basis, then we say they have a process addiction. So, question. Why is it that 97% of addicts come from this thing called complex trauma? So complex trauma, I'll talk about next week, simply is this. is a child who for some reason lives with some fear. They could come from a very abusive home and you would understand that they, un they live in fear. But they could come from a fairly good home. But there could be one or two events in that home where they felt neglected, they felt judged harshly, where now they are in fear. And when the brain is in fear, the amygdala, that's the part of the brain, it begins to go to survival mode, which is fight or flight. So the child is saying, I don't have the tools to cope with this problem that are healthy tools. My only tools are to fight or flight. And if I'm too little to do either, freeze, shut everything down, and try not to feel. So a person who's begun to do that will usually use food, use sex, use other ways of coping that aren't healthy for them. But then when they find drugs and alcohol, they go, wow, I just found the solution to my problems. I just found something that takes me out of my pain, takes me out of having to be on guard all the time, takes me out of feeling danger all the time. I have just found something that finally gives pleasure and makes life better. And then, five years later, they go, what I thought was my friend has become my enemy. What I thought was the solution to my problems now has become a huge problem. But what I want you to understand is people that end up in addiction usually, not all cases, but usually come out of a place where there's complex trauma. And that drugs became, in their mind, the solution to their problems. So we've got a biological thing that happens in the brain. Complex trauma, we have a psychological, social element that is part of the problem. And then there's a third element, and that is what we call co-occurring or a mental health piece. It is fascinating to me that 90% of people with complex trauma or 90% of addicts have mental health issues. The most common of those are depression and anxiety. So when you live in fear for so long, you just have a lot of anxiety about stuff. When you live in a situation where you felt neglected or abused or abandoned, that's a depressing life. And so there's a, a, a depression that develops. Some kids that come out of trauma develop ADHD. Not all kids, but some. Dr. Gaber Maté, part of his research was looking into, is there a connection between ADHD and complex trauma? And what he saw is for some kids, they can't focus at school because they're worried about what's going to be happening at home tonight. And they're distracted by that because they are trying to solve the problem of finding safety at home. And so mental health issues becomes part of what people dealing with addiction also have to deal with. So to deal with addiction, you've got to deal with the biological piece and recognize that in a the mind. There's a chemical change that's happened. Then you've got to look at the mental health pieces of that, the complex trauma pieces, the psychological, and then there's a spiritual piece. So part of what has concerned me is a lot of Christians have just kind of said the solution to addiction is spiritual only. Just get Jesus and you're all better. What I want you to understand is that can do a lot of damage. Yes, there's a spiritual peace, but if we don't help them with the mental health, if we don't help them understand what's happening in their brain, if we don't help them deal with the trauma and learn healthy ways of coping besides the old ways of coping, then we've actually failed them. And that's what we've been doing. And we've had the privilege 
of watching people heal from their trauma, grow in their relationship with God, begin to develop healthy ways of coping and relating, and it's a beautiful thing to see. 